It's time for another episode of the Agents of Fandom podcast. We are live on Twitch. I feel like Thor in his first movie right now when he just said another because I've been streaming all day long. Happy Spider-Man 2 on PS5 day to all who celebrate. I've been streaming this one on uh, the Agents of Fandom Twitch page, having an absolute blast with this game. Joined today to talk some Loki by my co-host, good buddy, with me as always. Thank you for holding down the fort last week, Adam Blevins. Yeah, man, it was a it was a pleasure to get to talk to uh, talk to Garrett about Loki episode two, and I'm excited to be here with y'all. We're kind of in what I feel like is a bit of an unprecedented era that not enough people are talking about with the amount of content that we're getting right now. We got Loki and Gen V going at once. Spider Man two just launched today. Invincible season two and the Marvels coming in a couple of weeks. What a time to be alive, man! Every, it's, everything is so so crazy right now, but I'm excited to kind of dial it in and focus on Loki with you guys today. All these things, and I kind of completely forgot until I saw Brit's name in chat because I got a chance to meet Brit at New York Comic Con. That New York Comic Con was just last weekend as well. And so we have Invincible content, Percy Jackson content, Scott Pilgrim uh, takes off the new anime, Goosebumps, so much coming. Uh, so uh, keep your, your eyes peeled to the Agents of Fandom socials as well as agentsoffandom.com because it's coming. And you also should keep your ears peeled to the podcast feed because we got one of the co-hosts of the Listen 3000 podcasts, uh, a pod you should absolutely be subscribed to. Zen, how you doing? Hey, man. I'm glad to be here, man. Glad to be back on AOF with the fam, you know. I'm excited to talk Loki, man. This last episode was crazy. Crazy. It was crazy. And uh, we only got one more week to go, Adam, before... We haven't seen anything else, and as we know, shit is just going to continue to get crazy from here. Zen, I got to meet you in New York. It was fantastic. Yes. We got to yes. hang out. We had a good time. Uh, but we got one more very special guest today. Speaking of Thor, speaking of TJ, we got a Thor. We got a fellow TJ. You know him on socials as the Fat Thor. How you doing, my friend? Good, good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. This is surprisingly, this is actually the first time I've talked about this episode this week. Uh, so I'm super excited to get in on this. It worked out so well because Zen and I had planned like episode three, we were going to link back up for a while. Mm -hmm. And then Garrett couldn't make this one. And uh, Caesar's in Florida right now. And I was like, you know, I've been seeing you two link up, given these great <laughs> breakdowns of the episode. We had been talking about we got to link back up for one of these. And so this was just perfect timing. The stars aligned. Happy to have you on. We got so much to talk about. So I just want to dive right into it. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the Agents of Fandom podcast wherever you get your pods. Make sure if you're watching us on YouTube after the fact, you hit that like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and make sure you're joining us on Twitch each and every day because I'm going to be streaming Spider-Man 2. You want to talk about it? Come talk about it there because we got enough to talk about with Loki that uh, we're not going to be going through too much Spider-Man on this one today. Um, let's dive right into it. We get to meet Victor Timely. He who remains is uh, the, the, it's there before pre pre Timely. It's uh, before we dive into the episode. I guess I'm I'm getting ahead of myself too much. <laughs> Adam, what did you think about episode three as a whole? Because I did see some mixed feelings on uh, socials a little bit. A lot of people were like, "Wow, best one yet! This is incredible!" Um, and that was the majority that I saw. Then a few others just really didn't connect with this episode. What were your thoughts? Well, you know, <clears throat> I'm glad you bring that up because one thing that I was thinking today when I saw, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw last night some of these some of these mixed reactions like you were talking about. And, you know, we saw the first four episodes now been close to a month ago. And I was like, was I just like consumed by the hype of watching these episodes early? Is this episode, am I going to rewatch it now that it's out and just think it's like garbage? No, I, I watched it this morning. I loved it just as much as I did. It was really, really awesome to get to see Victor Timely and kind of like, a much bigger role than me and I think a lot of people were expecting to see from him, especially in only the third episode of the season. And also this this episode just perfectly captures what I think so many of us fell, why I think so many of us fell in love with Loki in the first place, which is the score and like the music from the very beginning when we first get that like the Marvel Studios title card. And it's like this bouncy piano, like 1800s type music. And we get that again too when we're first introduced to Victor Timely. And then at the end, when the episode cuts out, which I'm not sure we'll talk about at the end later, but then when the episode cuts out, we're on this like 
choir singing and going crazy i'm elevating up out of my chair and i'm just like this is this is what it's all about like this is why people love loki remember in the, i think it was episode two in the first season when they're in front of the supermarket and that score hits for the first time and i'm like this is this is the show right here like this is this is what we're doing so i don't know i really love this episode i was i was a little bit surprised to see so much of the negative feedback like especially when after i watched it and i was like i just didn't really pick up on any of that i know the victor timely jonathan majors performance because victor timely has been a little bit divisive especially um and i'm especially excited to to talk about that with y'all but no overall i, I love the episode they're three for three with me so far natalie holt has been incredible the score in most of these disney plus shows have been great but she just steps it up to a new level it's like you said that bouncy organ that was playing it made me feel like even as we were going through some suspenseful scenes throughout the episode it almost felt like a super old-timey movie before there was any talking in movies and so it was like just the acting and people were bouncing around and just like ah oh no like something crazy was about to happen and no matter how suspenseful it was it had that levity to it zen what did you think about episode three Man, it's just another banger added to what they've been doing. Um, I like that we got to go back and see like the past of the MCU and, and, and just that beginning of Kang, well, uh, Victor Timely. Um, and just to see kind of where he's coming from in this episode, I thought it was dope. Um, the performance from Majors on this, like he really sets it apart from a lot of the other versions that we've seen so far. And just to get, you know, we got uh, Ravona and Miss Menace. Like it was just, it was crazy, man. I, I love this episode. Uh, Fat Thor, throwing it to you next. Uh, that feels weird to say, but you put it up to the screen name, so I'm rolling oh, on that. <laughs> That's fine. That's what people know me as. Fat Thor is completely fine. Don't feel bad. But I mean, um, I just I gotta echo what my you know my good friends over here just said. I loved it. I'm no surprise there. But I mean, it was just great. You get a I got a Thor reference. We got Victor Timely. Like, and uh, I want to. Uh, go back to what Adam was saying too about the score like Natalie Holt is just so good and her score I really love I don't really even know how to describe it but uh specifically in this episode it's when they're looking at Odin and uh Balder it's like this like little violin little theme that she does in like the kind of more intimate scenes I just love that so much and that's a little tangent but yeah like I said I love this episode Victor Timely, I really, really loved his introduction. I thought they did it perfectly. We finally got a Balder the Brave reference for the first time in the MCU. We Sir. got it confirmed in uh, MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios, a book that we got to do an interview with the authors, Joanna Robertson, Dave Gonzalez, and Gavin Edwards, so make sure you check out that interview as well. But they confirmed in the book that like Daniel Craig was in the, in the running for Thor way back in the day uh it was considered you know and then uh there were the rumors when dr strange in the multiverse of madness was coming out that daniel craig was going to be balder the brave um <laughs> and be part of the illuminati and now we finally get our first balder reference that was really funny that just like that scene highlighted how amazing hiddleston has been like he's been incredible this whole series and he's been incredible his whole reign in the mcu but just like the quick like Thor's not that tall. It was just like, it's uh, <laughs> it's good. fantastic stuff. Um, we get to, episode, to be honest with me, episode two, three, and four were kind of blending into together for me after I watched the screeners because I watched them all together. Um, but seeing episode three on its own, I thought it was really great. And we get the TVA guidebook uh, extension, uh, like focused on here as that was what he Victor Timely was given just as a wee child. And then he turned that into um his kind of con artist tricks that he learned today as he eventually finds out more about the tva but adam let's talk about victor timely specifically um this was very diff different than the kang we saw in quantumania this was very different than the he who remains we saw we're starting to get the different tastes of jonathan majors playing a totally different character with each of these kangs yeah, I mean, the comparison to what we get here as opposed to, I mean, even in Loki season one and then in Quantumania, it's really stark. And like, I was super caught off guard by it when I see it for the first time. I saw it for the first time because it's like, I feel like I'm supposed to, like, just knowing what he's going to become, like, knowing that Kang is going to be the big bad, like, Jonathan Major's face is going to be the one they're trying to wipe out at the end of this multiverse saga. And then I'm like, watching this episode and I'm like, 
I like this guy. This is like a nice do. I, like I'm not. I'm, <laughs> are you trying to get me to hate this guy? Because like, I mean, and I don't think they are. But like, I know we're. That's kind of where we're headed with that, which is so interesting. And Majors does a great. I, I think he does a great job. It's one of the things we were talking about. Uh, shout out to uh, to Britt in the chat, like you said earlier. But one of the when I first got out of the episode, I saw I got on Twitter and I saw her said. Or her say that like whatever Jonathan Majors was doing as Victor Timely in this episode did not work for her at all. I mean, I, I saw quite a few people saying that too, and I feel the exact opposite. Like I felt really sympathetic for him, and like because he, it kind of felt like he was really being pulled in all these directions. Like he's just a guy that wants to focus on his inventions and do these things, and then he's got all these people that he doesn't know from these different timelines, like grabbing him and doing all these crazy things to him. And it was just, I really felt sympathetic for him, and and I think knowing what we know about him that takes like a really special talent and somebody like majors to do that. And he does a great job with that in this episode, but I don't know, like overall, this is not what I was expecting from timely. And I, I like that because it's like, it, it's not just bringing us in. It's like, okay, this is just another, he's just like Kang. We, we hate him. He's just out to conquer the world. He just doesn't like, that was kind of what I was expecting. Like a guy that's like now power hungry, but just doesn't have the tools at his disposal because he's stuck in the 1800s or whatever. But like, now we see it and it's like he's on this this such a different path than i think anybody really could have foreseen and i don't know i i, I really like it like i really like what they're doing with him and i i don't want to i'm trying to uh to be vague you know like now that i'm these things are kind of coming back and we know how this next episode ends so i'm not trying to i'm trying to be a little be vague about it but i don't know overall overall timely's great and like and i hope we get to see a whole lot more timely going forward for sure i am very excited for next week's episode where we just get to mm. all freak out together but uh um it's funny it's like you said i i too saw a lot of different people on twitter just like polarized kind of by this performance one people feeling very strongly one way or the other and but because brit is here with us right now she gets to be the poster child for uh well brit hates it <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, uh, uh sorry bray you gotta take that one uh for the team thanks for tuning in today and what did you uh think about his performance and the one thing i found very interesting adam you mentioned how he was like he was pretty like likable he was almost protagonisty until the mention of partners pops up throughout the episode then you can really see the evilness of gang pop up within <laughs> victor timely what did you think of the performance set Oh man, the performance this episode has been crazy, man. And and just harping on what you said about the partnerships line, I found myself like watching this performance trying to draw like draw parallels between the other times we've seen like a King variant. And then once he said the partnership line, you see him like switch from this sympathetic character to like this evil villain that we all know he's gonna eventually become, you know? So I thought that was dope just to see like a little bit of range there. Like, oh, you're not, you know, something's up with you. You know what I mean? But yeah, the performance was incredible, yeah. Fat Thor, what'd you think? I gotta go four for four with the all. I loved it too. I thought it was great. And uh, I think too, what was really interesting and what you guys kind of harped on a little bit is like you said, with the partnership line. And also I thought just like the way that he described the temporal loom and how he describes like particles of chaos coming into order. I felt like that really to me showed the kind of both differences and similarities that these Kang variants share. Like Victor Timely is a completely different person. And like you guys are saying, he's like sympathetic. And to me, I just felt like, like you were saying, he's just like this kind of mad scientist dude who just wants to do his inventions. But at the end of the day, he is a Kang and he does have those kind of innate desire for control and what he seems as chaos he needs like to have control over that so i thought it was super interesting how jonathan majors kind of played on that with being a completely different character but yeah like i said gotta go agree with all y'all i loved it i'm happy you brought up the order and the chaos of it all because that tied in and with adam what you said about him being pulled all of these different directions mm -hmm. throughout this episode we kind of feel like the the race against the clock vibes right from the get-go with the score, but also Kei Kwan's uh, OB just being like, we're all gonna die, we're all gonna die! <laughs> right from the start of the episode. So we kind of feel the the urgency of it all. And throughout, Victor Timely is almost treated as like a MacGuffin. And it's like you say, say Adam, he's getting pulled in all of these different directions. There's Renslayer on one time who's trying to impose her own 
fascist order of just like this is I've been keeping order in the TVA. I can do it for I can continue to do it. Like this is my role now. I need to keep things my way or the highway. You got Sylvie on the other side representing the chaos of I just want to burn all this shit down. Fuck the TVA. Fuck Victor Timely. Fuck he who remains. Everybody, I want to go back to my life and I just want to get rid of all of this shit. And then there's Loki in the middle pulling him another direction of just like, ah, can't we find a little bit of a, a happy medium and just focus on the immediate problem of the time loom blowing up. Um, that to me was sort of the theme of the episode, Adam, and it tied into what you were saying about him getting pulled in a bunch of different directions. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting to watch because like, I found myself thinking throughout, I'm like, Loki is the only one being reasonable here. And if you had told me 10 years ago, <laughs> While I was watching the MCU, that there would come a day when I'm watching a project that includes Loki, that I'd be like, wow, Loki's the only one in this project being reasonable. I would have been like, I don't know what the fuck they're going to do with Loki. Because in his early days in the MCU, he's like, it's on the opposite end of the spectrum. Everybody else is like, Thor is constantly the one trying to talk him down. Because it just, if you, if you play this out in the past with like a different version of Loki, like Thor would be the one. Like, I kept, I found myself like noticing too a lot of the parallels just with like, kind of like I was getting ready to go into right there is this version of Loki with like these earlier versions of Thor. Like I, I feel like, he, I don't know if he sees some of himself or some of Thor in himself, but like, I kind of see that in him. Like just, just constantly like fighting for the right thing, like no matter how hard it is. And I know he, he got his memories back and stuff in, uh, in the first season. So I'd like to think, even though this low, we didn't go on that journey with this Loki. We know that. I mean, he got pulled right out of the battle in the Avengers, but then we got to see him, go through that. So I kind of like to like to think in my own little head cannon a little bit that like he watched all that kind of stuff and was like, you know what? Like my brother was right. Like I'm going to, I'm going to go through this and, and be like my brother. Um, but I don't know. It's there's some, there's some interesting parallels too with Miss Minutes and Renslayer because they're both kind of operating on very similar agendas. They just want to get Victor timely back to the TVA. So then th they can become a partnership in their own eyes and rule with Kang, you know, he becomes Kang, he remains or whatever. And then it's like, Sylvie, I, I'm kind of, I've been kind of pissed off with Sylvie this season. Like I really, I mean, going, dating all the way back to, to the end of last season, I'm just kind of like, any time, and, and you know, I still think um, Sophia DiMartino is, is doing great. I love her, but like, I'm just really frustrated with the, I, I, I haven't once seen Sylvie pop up and get into a discussion. I'm like, you know what? great job sylvie like i think you're doing great i don't know it's <laughs> it's it, it's this whole situation is just like it's, it's really kind of confusing and crazy and everything but like I'm, I'm i'm still having a good time watching it it's interesting because we talk about well you talked about how renslayer and sylvie kind of embody the order and the chaos but then you have loki and mobius sort of doing the same thing but on way smaller scales so you almost have the extremism of sylvie in terms of chaos the extremism from renslayer in terms of order and then the moderate chaos from loki that is every now and then you need that as we saw in episode two the moderate order from mobius who's just trying to keep things straight but is willing to break the rules when the rules don't really make any sense um and you kind of have that balance between the four of them that i find I find really, really interesting, and like you said, I don't, I don't know if it's as much as he wants to be more like Thor, but I do think he wants to be more, and uh, like you said, Adam, and looking back at those memories, I think it kind of comes back to Thor's line in Ragnarok, where he says, you know, you've always been the god of mischief, but what I'm trying to say is you could be so much more. And I think that's what exactly what we're seeing Loki kind of ascend to throughout this. But then we finally get reintroduced to Miss Minutes in a big way. This episode, she begins just as the big giant ghost scaring everybody, and then she's prominent throughout. What did you think about Miss Minutes? Miss Minutes was crazy this episode. I've been seeing her in so many different forms. It seems like she knows so much more than than uh, she's letting on. But like her. Uh, obsession with Kang and, and wanting to take things, you know, to different levels, wanting to be human, wanted to, it's, I don't she wants, she wants some Kang, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> I mean, what can I say? Like she, she was showing out this episode, man. And, and she really was the highlight. I feel like this was the first time, like she really got this kind of spotlight. 
I know we all love Miss Menace as a character, and like you see the the Twitter account saying all types of crazy stuff all the time. But like the fact that like now she's like this this entity in the story that's like we know something's something's up with her, something's a little sinister with her. That it, it was dope to see this episode. It's so interesting the way they play it, where it's like Victor Timely is sort of like a MacGuffin throughout the episode, and then Miss Minutes, the AI, is a full character who is integral to the plot and changes it, but not because she's the item being chased, but because she is a sentient being really throwing things out. She gave giving me big, big uh, like, uh, Ida, Ada, whatever her name was, vibes from uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the LMD, who was wanting to become uh, a real human. Um, Fat Thor, what did you think about Miss Minutes in the episode and how horny she got? <laughs> You're gonna throw that one to me, huh? But uh, <laughs> but I mean, like like Zen said, you know, I I loved Miss Minutes in this episode. But I will say, I want I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, and we'll circle back. I'm gonna be the Sylvie defender here tonight because I think she's a little misunderstood. I'm gonna push back a little bit on the Sylvie talk, okay. but I think it applies also with Miss Minutes. I kind of feel for Miss Minutes as well. I mean, like you just said, she's a fully conscious, sentient AI. And what I thought was super interesting is that uh, He Who Remains made her before the multiversal war, before he made the TVA. So, like, she's been around for a minute. So I kind of felt bad for her. Like, she wants to be a person. Like, she's been doing this dude's, like, you know, bidding for however long. And I think, too, it kind of goes to the whole differences of timely and he who remains because he who remains seemed like a more serious kind of guy i think she saw timely was like hey he doesn't really know what's going on like i can teach him like i can have the power in this kind of i can fix him there. exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> but no like i said i felt for her a little bit i felt for her a little bit it was really interesting and i agree i think sylvie has the best of intentions where i kind of view her as that extreme chaos is like she's just so impulsive she doesn't think things through she's just like i am doing this now whereas our loki is he's a he's a planning chaotic you know what i mean like he's that type that's got a really messy room but is like i know where everything is um whereas <laughs> sylvie is like oh i can't find this shirt i'm not gonna clean my room i'm just gonna buy a new shirt um that's kind of the, like the difference of how i view uh the two of them but adam it was so interesting the dynamic to me between miss minutes and renslayer how they're they're teaming up to get this done but both are willing to throw each other under the bus at any moment to get what they want and they're both just fawning over not necessarily who timely is but the idea of him yeah um we're gonna start a dialogue real quick I, we got we got something that we need to that we need to talk about so I am on record. I'm, I'm a little bit unkind. I don't know if this is controversial or not. I'm a bit, I was a bit uncomfortable with the Loki season one romance between Loki and Sylvia, because I stand by that. Like, these are the same, these are two variants of the same person. Like I know they're, they're not like, you know, but, and then now we get to this season. Narratively, it makes so much sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. True. I don't True. care. And then now we get to this season and it's Victor Timely and a clock. That's our relationship history through this show. Two of the same people falling in love, like the same person falling in love with himself and a clock of a, a virtual clock fawning over. He like, I don't know what's going on in the, love I, I still love, love the show. Love. <laughs> yeah. And this is not, this is not a, uh, an indictment on the show that I'm saying this, by the way, this is just, you know, this is just me being unserious, but I would just love to see what's going on now. I mean, granted the little bit of Renslayer and timely that we get is, you know, that kind of resolves a little bit of this, some of these weird romances that we've got. I mean, then he throws her out of the boat. So I don't know if we can really count that, but I don't know. I mean, this whole, the whole dynamic, between the three of them, just like watching it was making me really uncomfortable. Like not in a bad way, not in I'm like, oh, they handled this poorly or anything. I'm just like, cause I think that was kind of by design. Like we're supposed to be like, oh, this is like kind of icky watching like this little love triangle here where both of them are interested in him, but he's really not even remotely interested in either one of them. Um, and I think he's still just kind of trying to figure out what the hell is going on. I don't know if there is a path for him and 
and Renslayer, like, you know, later or, or whatever, because I, I believe I've heard people say that that's like a thing in the comics or, and I may be completely off on that. I'm not sure um, that they have a history together in the comics, but I don't know the, I, I just, we just, I got to talk to the people. I need to talk to somebody that's inside. If, if Loki does a writer's room, I know Marvel doesn't have a history of their TV shows of doing writer's rooms, but if there's a writer's room for Loki, I need to talk to the people who were like kind of pushing the rock forward with the romances because like we're over two as far as I can see so far. I think you're incorrect and we're two for two, but not only that, Adam, oh, if oh. saying bromance wasn't enough, you're going to, you're going to okay. get the Loki of Twitter all over you again, because now you're saying there's no romance there either. And so there's uh, not get over it. Everybody there's, look, look, there's a type of romance and then, and uh, you can maybe, maybe you can call it bromance if you want, but what I, what I see is shout out to my new girl fans. Loki and Mobius are Nick and Schmidt. Loki is Schmidt and and uh, and Mobius is Nick. And they're just messing around and uh, arguing with each other with the exact same uh, banter. And that's who the two of those uh, guys are. And there's there's love there. There is absolutely love between Nick and Schmidt. I, I gave you cookie, gave, gave, got you cookie. But moving uh, moving on to the uh, the next thing, I do think it's so interesting how while all these Kangs are going to be very very different, and Majors is going to portray them very very differently, he they all share a similar characteristic. And that is that of a conqueror. It's me up top. It's me here at the top of the pyramid and nobody else. They've been giving these Renslayer and Kang love story teases throughout. One, it's obviously a big comic storyline. Two, um, they have the uh, recording uh, that was playing at the big, at the first episode that they, uh, that they tease. And then again, at the end of this episode where Miss Minutes goes... Yeah, I got something I'm going to tell you about him. Um, because clearly there's some ulterior motive here. This isn't when he throwing her in that canoe and dropping her in the to swim away. That's not the first time he screwed her over. And we see even in Quantumania with that Kang, whether it be Janet, whether it be uh, Bill Murray's character, whoever, he's willing to Modoc. He's willing to work with people and utilize them, but never equal to him just they they have to be below him and they still have to be working on his agenda because he is the master of these timelines these agendas he's he's the master of control um and so i do think that no matter how different all of these characters are it's very interesting how that one characteristic seems to mimic it um adam we've talked about sylvie's Spontane spontaneity and maybe lack of thinking things through imp impulsiveness a little bit. But one place that we see that when Victor Timely, again, who knows that this is out of fear or maybe a little bit of manipulation, hits all of the beats to get Sylvie to feel bad for him perfectly. I am my own person. I have my own life. You don't know me. I'm not the same as everything else. And she she spares his life. What did you think about that scene and what that means for her arc? So this is the the Sylvie pessimist in me, the the Sylvie hater in me that's going to say this. But like, even I want to go to I want to get Adam and Fatboy next on the polar opposite, <laughs> and then bring me some balance in between the two of them. To close it up. Let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> so the the pessimist in me watching it this morning too. Even I was thinking like. When they're when her and Loki are fighting over him, she's trying to kill him. He's trying to protect him. They're at like obviously they're the same person, so they're just kind of at this like stalemate for the entire time. I mean, I know their like motives are different, but it's like I I didn't get the feeling that one of them was even close to like taking the advantage over the other one and, and you know gaining control of him or anything. Like Loki was just barely able to protect him, and she was like getting really close to being able to kill him. And in my mind, she was just like, you know what? we could run around in circles and do this shit all day. Like, fine, I'll go with you. Maybe I'll get my chance to do it later. Like, I don't, I don't know. I just, and I know that's not how we're, that's like probably not how we're supposed to be reading it. We're supposed to be like, Oh, Sylvie's finally feeling, you know, compassionate and, and feeling understanding towards him. Cause he did, he gave that great spill about, you know, like you said, I'm, I'm my own person. This, my brain doesn't have any of that stuff or whatever, which by the way, just that particular scene, another, I think was awesomely delivered by Jonathan majors, but I don't know that whole, 
that whole thing. I'm just not, I'm not bought in on, on Sylvie being a changed character after that. And maybe, maybe, you know, I'm happy to look back in three weeks and be like, Hey, I was wrong. And I know you'll tell me if I was TJ, you'll be like, Hey, you remember three <laughs> weeks ago when you were wrong? And I'll be like, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I remember. But, uh, yeah, let me see ahead, if buddy. I can change. Let me see if I can change your mind a little bit here, Adam, or enlighten you, <laughs> if you would. So I, I don't know the way that I read that, and kind of Sylvie's whole thing in this season. Uh, me and Zen actually talked about this a couple times before, and to me, it's all about free will. And like her whole thing is, she believes that everyone deserves to have free will and to make their own decisions, whether or not that's a good or bad decision. So I think that in this scene in particular, when she when Timely specifically says, I make my own choices to me, I felt like she still wants to kill him. She doesn't have like a change of heart, like, oh, I like, you know, he got to me like I like him now. She still does not like him. But to me, I think she realized in that moment that if she were to kill him, she would be doing exactly the same thing that the TVA has been doing. And that he who remains has been doing the exact thing that she is like actively fighting against. Like that's her whole thing that she says the TVA needs to burn and, you know, all this stuff. So if she killed he or uh, Victor Timely, she's preventing him from having the free will to make his own choice. Like, yeah, he could become another he who remains, but maybe he could just be a regular scientist as well. But the fact that he has that choice is what's important to Sylvie. So I think when he, he said that, that made her realize, I'm if I do this, I'm no different than Renslayer that you know pruned my timeline and forced me to go into hiding in all these you know catastrophes and whatnot. So that's how I saw. It. I don't necessarily think she like had a change of heart of like, oh, I'm not going to murder this guy. She still is a hundred percent ready for action at any time. But I think, like I said, it was more so of a philosophical, like, oh, um, I can't do this. You know, does that make sense? I think that was, said. that yeah. was, yeah, like Thank beautifully you. articulated. I think that makes a lot of sense. Zen, what was your read on the situation with Sylvie? And where do you think her character goes from here? Like at the end of the day, if they don't solve this problem, everything is going to blow up. <laughs> yeah. Or we're all going to die, according to <laughs> Kihi Kwan, according to OB. Yeah, and I, 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 don't, I mean, I feel like she's a work in progress. And I feel like the actions that she showed in this episode definitely kind of shows that she has the potential to uh, make the right decisions uh, compared to the stuff that we've seen her do so far in the, in the show. Um, where I see her go next, man, I, I honestly don't know. I feel like... The actions in this episode open the door for them to like maybe put her push her in another direction, but um, I honestly, I, she she's such a wild card to me with how she moves throughout the the story. So I feel like they like to keep her in that place because you know you can surprise you can surprise the fans with that. So we'll see, man. I think that's one of the reasons this show is so exciting is we have two versions of the same character, Loki and Sylvie, who their biggest thing is trickery it's mischief and one one of the things i love in a story is not knowing what's coming next and that really is the case with this show because everybody is such a wild card you have the embodiment of order taking on these wild cards and who are just trying to throw a wrench in all of these situations and it's so incredibly interesting i think it's uh everything that fat thor said in addition to what brit says in chat I think it's supposed to be like she understands not becoming what she's supposed to be and she's she's different than Loki and therefore it makes sense that Timely is different than he who remains. If she's a different person, which she was trying so hard to explain throughout season one, I'm not you, I'm not him, I'm different. When somebody's saying this to her, it that, that hits a lot of the same beats as to what she was trying to say. So that on top of the whole free will thing, I think that really makes a lot of sense. And ultimately she decides to as well not kill Renslayer and kick her right through to the end of time with Miss Minutes. I gotta say, bad call. Now maybe, and I'm, I'm going to, Adam, I know you, you're probably going to agree with me here, bad call, so I'm going to go with you first, and then Fat Thor, I want your rebuttal. But bad call, because now these two 
crazy ladies. We got Renslayer who's out here being like, I got to take over the TVA and create my own sacred timeline. You got Ms. Minutes who's like, I want to fuck. And together, <laughs> it's, a terrible it's a terrible combination. And now they're at the end of time, which in theory could probably be a pretty powerful place if they figure out how to use it. Ms. Minutes probably knows how to work it. Adam, it seems like dangerous to me. Well, I'm just going to say, since you said, I assume that, you know, so you assumed that I was going to agree with you. I'm just going to say, I think your point is stupid and you're wrong. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but no, I really, I really didn't like, to be honest, when that happened, I wasn't like, oh man, they fucked up now because I was more just kind of like, what the fuck are they going to do here? Like they're now, I mean, I don't know what they, what good they can do with, you know, he who remains is however many hundred year old corpse or how, however old his corpse is. And, you know, and then a really nice little living room looking space. And, you know, they've got the, the big like physical timeline behind them, but I'm like, I don't know. I mean, that whole, that kind of, it kind of threw me off. Like, I mean, I'm sure they're, they've got a much bigger role to play in the, uh, the last three episodes, but like, I definitely wasn't like, Oh man, like Sylvie fucked up. Now I was just kind of like, wait, what the fuck are they going to do from here? Like, it seems like they're almost kind of fucked. I think now, like, I, but I don't know. I could be, I could be way off on that. That's definitely what it seems. It's just, I don't like the idea that the two of them are together. That to me spells bad news. I don't know. Was it, give me my rebuttal. Was it bad news? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I never even really thought of it that way. Like the way you're set, but I mean, I totally agree. That makes a lot of sense. Like, like you just said, I mean, Miss Minutes basically ran that place. So if she's there, I don't know, maybe she could do something. But like I said, I never really even thought about it. The one thing I will say, though, that I did think of is so like so we see in is it episode two when Sylvie has the he who remains. I, I wouldn't even say it's a temp pad, but his like little ring sort of thing that she can travel the time doors. Uh, my question is when. Is, has she been back there? Because, I mean, she basically runs everything now since she killed him. So, I mean, you could say that that's her citadel. So a thought that popped into my mind, maybe she did that on purpose and was like, yeah, fuck you, Renslayer. Like, you know, just take a time out in here for a little while. This is your time, God. Look what I did to him. Like, you get what I mean? That's kind of how I thought. But I, I, I like your thought process, though. I like Something nefarious going on. Like, I, I, I definitely think that's what she was thinking. Like, I know there's no way out of here, and I got the only thing that could get us out. So, ha, bang. Yeah. But I don't like it. I don't, I think there's, uh, I think something is afoot. I think, I suspect foul play. Uh, Zen, what do you think could be going on with Renslayer, Miss Minutes, the, West, the rest of the way through here? Yeah, I gotta agree with you, man. Uh, Miss Minutes has been down there for how, who knows how long. And like, I feel like she has the codes to all the doors in there, man. Like, I feel like that's that was a bad move. I feel like, and I feel like we're we're gonna figure at least by the end of the season. I, that's my guess that we're gonna that's gonna come back to bite Sylvie for her sending her there. Like, that's like who knows what's in that building. We don't even know how big the Citadel is. So like, who knows what's there? What type of power is there? Like, uh, yeah, I definitely think that was a bad bad move. We ended up going through this episode a lot quicker than I thought we were going to. And I think one of the reasons is, as great as this one was, Adam, you and I have kind of been just biting our tongue a little bit because all, like, all without, obviously we can't spoil anything, so spoiler-free review of the next episode is just that it's fucking chaotic. It's wild. <laughs> it's crazy. You can um, say and that so twice. It's just, it's one of those things that it's like, um... There's a lot that's going to be going down, and they set a lot of it up in this episode, and uh, they lobbed it up in this episode. Next one, they're taking the swing. And so it's really going to be very interesting to see where this series goes from here. Um, and so make sure you stay tuned to the Agents Fandom Podcast because we'll be breaking it down next week as well. Episode 4 and then throughout the rest of this season. Plus, so much more content coming uh, in terms of podcast feed and video coverage we have 
Um, still, my uh, my interviews from uh, the Saskatchewan Expo a couple weeks ago. So we got Kari Payton, the voice of Aqualad, Cyborg. He's Ezekiel in The Walking Dead and so many other things. Um, as well as uh, Amy Jo Johnson, the Pink Power Ranger herself. Shout out to Mark in chat. Uh, and I'm going to be streaming Spider-Man 2. I'll be back tomorrow, Saturday. Um, not sure the time yet because i got to check my work schedule. But I'll be back in the afternoon um, as well as most days from there. Plus, tons of written content coming with the shows coming out right now. Loki, Gen V, as well as... Killers of the Flower Moon is out now. We got New York Comic Con coverage uh, that uh, is still coming with Invincible, Scott Pilgrim, Goosebumps, Percy Jackson, and a lot, lot more. I was biting my tongue, and so there may be a couple things that I uh, I didn't get uh, out. So while Zen, I'm throwing it to you first. While uh, you're giving us your socials, while you're giving us uh, um, the plug about the Listen Three Thousand podcast. Um, I want to know what are like on top of you know just like your plugs. Give me, give me. You guys have been uh, doing the Loki after show. You guys, you you got the less than three thousand pod. You uh, and I want to know where they find you on socials. But if you got any other theories or anything like that, this is your time. Get your shit off. No, no agenda. No, no rundown. No podcast rundown. If you got something about the show that you want to still get off, get it off your chest. Now's your time. All right, man. I'm trying to think, man. Something crazy. Um. I did have a theory I was throwing out. We still haven't got that answer about who, how did he build the TVA? What are those parts coming from? I'm throwing my theory out. He took pieces from all over the multiverse. That's the X-Men door that everybody keeps saying it is. And and yeah, that's that's my crazy theory for the end of in the end of the series. But yeah, um, you can follow me on all socials at Army Z E N N. Um, and also follow Listen Three Thousand, Listen Three Thousand on all social media and. Spotify, YouTube, all as well. We're part of the Ages of Fandom Podcast Network. So, you know, yeah, that's me. Fat Thor, what about you? Where can the people find you, you on socials? Where can they find your written content, your video content? Where do you stream? Give us all the goods. And do you have any crazy theories to close us out? Uh, well, crazy theory, like you said, I got to bite my tongue a little bit. But as I don't know about crazy theory, but I will leave you all with something to mull over if you will we were talking all this victor timely stuff and you know uh i think adam is the one who brought up the point like oh maybe he's you know doing some of this stuff purposely i will i will leave you guys with so victor timely in the comics is actually kang prime meaning that he was the first kang to start his time travel journey and he actually so he fights the avengers and he takes up the guise of victor timely and he creates this town in Wisconsin. So I will leave you, like I said, the Victor Timely in the comics is a Kang kind of in disguise. So I, like I said, I think that's very interesting and could possibly come into play. So that's my kind of theory for you guys. But as far as where to find me, I mean, the name says it all. You can find me at the Fat Thor on Twitter. Uh, I'm the host of the Sons of Mjolnir podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, pretty much all other podcast platforms. I'm the comic editor over at The Streamer. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R. No E at the end. And yeah, you can find all my comic reviews over there. We have a great team of people. We do movies, games, TV anything you could think of come check us out and yeah like i said come find me at the fat thor i'll talk loki any kind of nerd stuff you want and i don't want to speak out of turn because i'm not the host of this show but i don't think it's out of turn because i co-own the whole damn thing and so i definitely think you should uh try and uh you should link up with damon and hop on the comic corner show that we do on youtube where uh right. he and uh af uh af parker is going to be joining him as a co-host now to talk more dc as well so i feel like you would be a great addition on that show if you ever want to join adam did i forget anything anything else we got to plug before we get out of here no no you guys got everything but yeah i mean just i think like you guys all mentioned it, but make sure y'all are checking out the uh because you guys uh Zen and TJ, y'all go live, if I'm not mistaken, right as soon as the Loki episode's in, right? The uh, For All Time After Show, if I'm not mistaken. Everybody, yeah, so everybody's that's watching, a, make sure you check that out. That's a great show. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's yeah, a collab that me and Zen have been doing, uh, like you said, for, for All Time After Show. So come check us. Talk even more, Loki, if you didn't get enough of us today. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir.
it's one of those shows that really you can go on and on and on about it because much like the multiverse and all their branch timelines there's so many different branched out theories you could go like we could do 20 minutes on each of the scenes and what all of the things meant but this isn't WandaVision time where we finally got one thing to latch on to. We got 12 different things right now, and uh, it's tough to keep all the different content going in the brain. Thank you so much to everyone who joined live. Make sure you subscribe to the Agents Fandom Podcast. Hit, Give us a like button on YouTube. I want to give a shout out to Zach Pat Smith in chat. First time chatter joining us for a live show for the first time. Thank you so much for tuning in. And like I said, I will be back Saturday, Sunday, Monday, every day streaming uh, Spider-Man 2 for PS5. So make sure you check that out. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And we will see you next week. Peace. Peace. Ruben, are you with us? Are we still live? <laughs> Oh, so that chat was just, you know. Oh, shit. Oh, Sorry. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, so we, yes. So uh, we're still here. Uh, somebody hey, call hey, Ruben. Hey, somebody hey. in chat call Ruben. And uh, <laughs> we'll to, to hit us with the end on here. Um, we're just trapped. I in can't break exit. I should, I'm not the one running the stream. I'm not the one running the stream. Ruben's probably in the bathroom or something. Maybe he fell asleep. Maybe he's playing Spider Man. He's literally probably playing Spider Man. Probably, Spider-Man. probably um, Spider Man. And so uh, I can't click exit, Aisha, because I'm not the one running it. This is how the sausage gets made, people. This is how the sausage gets made. It's not all perfect all the time. Sometimes <laughs> shit goes wrong. Ruben is the best graphic designer and producer in the business, but sometimes he disappears and he is not here to end the stream. Uh, and so uh, that's that's what happens. I get maybe I should just start playing Spider Man again. Maybe I should. Hey, just, let's uh, all let's uh, all just hey, hop man. on Spider Man. Where are you guys? Yeah, right. <laughs> Where's of Spider Man? No, right. <laughs> now, I would inevitably end up with three people being spoiled, given who are depending on whoever was uh, was ahead. So that wouldn't be great. Right. But if we have, if we're gonna be sitting here for a few extra minutes, and Chad's still here, I want to talk about this game, like because yeah, yeah, yeah. holy shit. It, it, it's like they literally took everything from the other two games and were like, yeah, we could do that better. Like, yeah. literally everything. everything. And everything. I, I can't <laughs> with the traversal in particular. And now Ruben may just cut us off at any minute, so it may just be like, I can't go to it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But the traversal, especially like the uh, – the slingshot launch just into the web wings, yeah. all the cool shit. Like I just see, I thought I, I wasn't gonna be... like the web wings at first. Same. I was like, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna swing. Like you know, I don't need all that. I'm a Spider Man. What the fuck am I flying for? Right. But <laughs> as soon as I tried it, I was like, oh, I'm an idiot. Like this, I, sp- this I is spend awesome. so much time just, just like launching into web wings into swinging. I'm just like, I, I got five thousand meters to go. No, I'm not fast traveling. I'll just, I'll just, I'll work my way there and, and do everything. I haven't even fast traveled just... once yet. Not one. Me either. Oh, no, no that's a lie. I have done it. Me neither. Not yet. Yeah. I will. I will say though, I, I've done it once just to see because you know there's all this like all this talk about how crazy it is, and it, like if you get it, just just do it once just to see really because it's like, you know, in the previous games they get you had to like fast travel to the police precincts or or whatever anything like that. Mm-hmm. Now like once you get to the point where you unlock it, you can literally hover anywhere in the entire area. And it just transports you there. It's like if you pick an alley, like it, it, within an instant, you just are all of a sudden swinging through that alley. Like even if it's all the way across the map, like you can go anywhere on the That's entire right. map instantly. That shit. That's like I did just crazy. did it once just to test it out. And I was like, oh my God, like this is, this is unreal. The entire yeah. game is, is just unreal. The, oh, the Even just like the swinging and the combat, which I thought was, which I love the combat of the other games too. So right. I was like, if it's the same, that's fine with me. And it's like, Obviously, it's the same in the sense of like you hit the same buttons, but it just feels so much better, like smoother, oh. quicker, faster, brutal. Like, and yeah. again, like literally every aspect of it, they were just like, let's make it better, make it better. Mm-hmm. Between the abilities and the gadgets, especially with Peter's, uh, the spot like the arms and everything, and then now we've got oh. these new gadgets. Like, I just, I don't know, it's so, and especially like as you get more comfortable with it, like parents specific like gadgets and combinations and upgrading mm-hmm. these skills. Like I'm just like, I'm, I'm just like, you find these little combinations that you can just wipe out like five people almost. Oh my God. I just, they, they did it again. Like this is like a generational run of like three video games mm-hmm. like in the same universe. Like I don't know 
that I can, like God of War, like the reboot of God of War has like two, like I think it's two of the greatest games of all time, like God of War and God of War Ragnarok. But like, this is like for a run of three, like, I don't know. This is, this is as good as it gets for me. Like, and I know there's been, gaming's been going on a lot longer than I've been alive. So I'm not going to say mm-hmm. of all time or ever, but <laughs> this feels all like as long time. as I've been alive. Of all time. <laughs> <laughs> as, long, as long as I've been alive and playing video games, I don't remember three games back to back to back that I've enjoyed this much. Dude, like, no, just no fuck way. banger yeah. after banger after banger. It's so good. Question the one three, thing. Uh, the- Oh, I was gonna yeah. say, uh, did do y'all find yourself playing uh, as Peter or Miles more, like throughout the game so far? I'm Miles all day, baby. That's my main. I mean, obviously, it switches you. Like, I don't really have a choice. Right. I don't even think I've I've personally switched like once. I just kind of go with whoever it gives me, and then I just keep going until it switches me. See, I'm personally, I'm kind of just like. I'm pretty far. I think I'm, I think my thing says I'm like 30%. I'm doing a lot of side stuff too, but I think it says I'm like right at 30%. So I'm like right at a third of the way through. I've, and I've switched a few times. I, I like kind of keeping it like really, really balanced. Like I, cause they're both like so fun to play as. Like I, I personally, when we got a uh, Miles Morales, I wasn't the kind of person in the first game to use all the gadgets and stuff. Like I was just kind of a, like a button masher. Like I was just mashing square. And then we got Miles Morales and all the venom powers. And I was like, okay, like they've got to like, for, for me, I was like, they have to, to buff Peter like hardcore because now that Miles is doing all the venom shit, like you can't just yeah. go back to punching square, like punching square over and over again. <laughs> and now you give Peter. Yeah, that's why I love Miles, the gadgets. venom shit. Right. And I it's love like, his venom power. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I personally have found myself playing like equally as both. Cause there's a few times where you get like two or three like Miles missions or two or three like Peter missions in a row. Mm-hmm. In that case, like if I've done like two Peter missions in a row and then I see the third one's Peter, I'm like, no, I'm gonna go switch and play as. Let me go play as Miles for like an hour. Like, let me just go swing around and do some shit as Miles. Like, I don't want to. Like, the fact that we even get that too is so cool that it's not just kind of like a supporting. Like, you can literally just play as either Spider. Oh, this! I can't believe this is even this even game. Even exists. I'm glad we. Got, I'm actually glad we got a chance to talk about it on the air a little bit too. Hell it's, yeah! It's so cool. Yeah. And I oh. love the costumes too, like the suits and shit. Like, I'm a I'm a cosmetic oh. whore, dude. I love that Damn. kind of stuff. So, not only is there a shit ton of suits, but I can change the color like uh game of the year game of the year right there it's got to be yeah i love the uh like all the different colorways was one of those things too that i was just like like after seeing a lot of them in the trailers like kind of like the web wings like you were talking about tj earlier i was like mm-hmm. I-, I probably won't end up using that and then like literally peter's first suit like the the advanced suit 2.0 has got that red and black variant and i'm like mm-hmm. this yeah. is sick. like i'm like i'm already no, no, using yeah, it and I'm, like, using, like, for both of them i'm like both of the characters, as soon as I unlock a suit, I'm like, well, now I've got to get the variants and see what all the variants are. And usually it's just like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Which I don't know if we're like, I don't want to like spoil it for anyone, maybe in the chat or if we're going major spoilers or whatever. But that I'm first a, I'm mission. About, I'm about five hours in, so we can't, no, no, no nothing to yeah, do. Let's keep no, it I'm talking first. first <laughs> I'm talking the very first thing you do in the game, the first oh, mission, okay. like the first web swing. Dude, oh, yeah. that was literally incredible like oh my mm-hmm. god that was yeah. so awesome like and i've uh, seen pretty much every review i've seen has said this so like sorry if this is a redundant point but the like sense of scale in the first mission is just like absolutely insane yeah oh uh, and i'm so we got excited back, to... so i'm oh, gonna nice. take this out because okay. i've been streaming <laughs> for the last uh nine hours and so <laughs> I, that may, may, maybe not that seven hours, eight, eight hours. There it is for the eight last hours, eight yeah. hours. Uh, but uh, thank you for everyone who tuned in. This has been the Agents of Fandom after show. Uh, Ruben just wanted to extend it, and I was trying to be kind to him and get it done before the Diamondbacks game started. Uh, but uh, we got Agents of Fandom after dark. We'll be back tomorrow with some Spider-Man Two streaming. We'll see you tomorrow. Peace. Peace. Peace.